Welcome to our September webinar, a collaboration of the Federation for Children with Special Needs and the Recruitment Training and Support Center, RTSC. I am Eileen Sandberg, Training and Support Specialist for the RTSC. Today's webinar is Special Education, Know the Range of Classroom and School Placement Available by Law, presented by Linda H. Baum, PhD. Linda Baum, PhD. Did I do it right? I'm sorry. Brand. Stop. No, I can't stop. Oh. <laughs> sorry, everyone. It's okay. Brand. I did it again. Linda Brand, PhD, is a psychologist who specializes in supporting children, adolescents, and adults with disabilities and their families. She's a part time lecturer at Cambridge Health Alliance Harvard Medical School and a consultant at the Federation for Children with Special Needs. Dr. Bram worked at the Federation with staff to create a website called Special Education at Placement Options at fcsn.org slash SEPO, which she's going to talk about today. She is also the parent of children with special needs. Welcome, Dr. Bram. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you for inviting me. This is such an important topic to me, both as a psychologist, where I've worked side by side with families who have struggled to help their child succeed in school, and as a parent, I felt overwhelmed trying to support my own children. Even though I'd been in many IEP meetings for the children in my practice, I felt lost when trying to manage my own child's education. So my goal today is to provide parents with the information they need to navigate a complicated educational system, especially when it comes to knowing the range of placement options that are available by law. My belief is that there are many children who do well in inclusion or general education classrooms and some who need something different. I'm not here to recommend one type of classroom or school over another, but my goal is to explain what placements exist and to provide a roadmap for exploring what's best for a given child, especially for parents whose child might be struggling and they don't know what to do. We welcome your questions throughout the webinar. I can't provide legal advice, but we do hope to provide you with some guidance. And a little background to provide some context. In Massachusetts, there are almost 1 million school-aged children. 18% of those receive special education services. The majority of those children, about 89%, are uh, on IEPs and attending public school programs. Only 3% of those uh, receiving special education attend special education private schools outside of the district. Although the percentage of children placed outside the public school system is small, this number still represents about 6,000 children. And I don't wanna overlook this group and those who may become part of this group which is increasing over time. The challenges that these families have had in order to get to these placements are often significant. These are families whose children struggled in school despite everyone's best effort to make it work. Families generally want their child with a disability to attend their local public school like the other neighborhood children. But when that doesn't work, what I've found is that many parents don't know what options are available or what to do. Consistent with the Federation's mission to inform and empower parents, that is my hope for this webinar today. Let me offer an outline of the topics that I'll cover. I want to cover the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, uh, particularly your child's legal rights and the public school's legal obligation. I'll describe the continuum of educational placements, steps that parents can take, and also family stories that are all shared with permission and um, disguised also to protect privacy. So uh, idea, again, it's the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. These are your child's legal rights since 1975. I won't cover this in detail because the Federation uh, offers other trainings and on their website, uh, much more detailed information. So this is just meant to be a quick overview. Um, so FAPE is a free, appropriate public education. And what this means is that the child has a right to um, make 
uh, meaningful progress uh, where, uh, in, a, in a free uh, education in public school. And appropriate is related to the I in IDEA, which, has, which again stands for individual. What is an appropriate education depends on the child's unique learning needs. So those are ambiguous terms. What constitutes appropriate education and meaningful progress are often points of disagreement among team members. The law also requires that a child's educational needs include academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs. I've known parents who understood that only academic needs can be addressed at school, but this is not true. All areas must be considered under the law. Least Restrictive Environment, or LRE, is another important right, and it says that children with disabilities have the right to be educated alongside peers without disabilities to the maximum extent possible. Least restrictive environment is based on the child's needs, not their disability. That means we don't say, well, this child has this disability, so we'll put them in a separate classroom designed for children with that disability. It really depends on what the child needs. The law expresses a strong preference, but not a mandate for children with disabilities to be in class, uh, classrooms with children without disabilities. What this means is that public schools have to make every effort to include children with special needs in general education classrooms, which is the least restrictive setting on paper, before considering an alternate or more restrictive setting. Children also have a legal right to an individualized education plan, or IEP, and that means they have an education that is individualized and tailored to their disability. Children also have the right to make meaningful progress in an appropriately ambitious education. It has to offer more than just minimal benefit. And this was set forth uh, in a Supreme Court ruling in 2017. It was Andrew F. versus Douglas County School District. Um, what happened in this case was that a boy in Colorado named Andrew, he was diagnosed with autism, and in his parents' view, was not making adequate progress. His parents tried unsuccessfully to get him placed in a special education private school in a nearby town. The school district disagreed, making the legal argument that they were providing him with a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment, and that Andrew only had the legal right to minimal gains on his IEP. And the lower courts supported the, the public school's argument. Andrew's parents decided to place him at the private special education school on their own. So that means they had no public funding. They paid the tuition and arranged the transportation on their own. Andrew made significant gains there. This unusual case made it to the Supreme Court who ruled that Andrew did deserve to be making meaningful progress and more than minimal benefit in an education that they termed appropriately ambitious. They viewed the public school as not doing enough to challenge him based on the progress he made at the private school. This case was viewed as important in the disability community because it encourages that higher standard. And I should mention not all parents have the ability to pay for the expense of private school tuition and the legal fees uh, to advocate for, for their child in this way, but it, it did establish an important precedent. And it was a unanimous decision um, on the Supreme Court as well. Pub, so now the public school legal obligations according to the uh, IDEA law. Um, so public schools legally have to provide a free appropriate education in the least restrictive environment since that coincides with the child's rights. They also have the obligation to provide a continuum of educational placements. For each child, the school must ask, what is the least restrictive environment for this child given the disability? The starting place is typically the general education class at the local public school. Exceptions are made when a child is dis uh, diagnosed with a disability at a young age. Maybe the child is known to the district from attending the special education preschool. At that point, the least restrictive environment starting in kindergarten may be a more restrictive placement, such as a substantially separate classroom. 
For example, a child with a visual impairment may do well in preschool, but be referred to a private school specializing in working with children with visual impairments for their elementary school years. For other children, the least restrictive environment may be a residential school for safety reasons or because of the intensity and severity of their educational needs. Uh, let me give an example of a, a four-year-old boy I knew. I'll call him Charlie. He had been diagnosed with autism around 18 months of age. His parents had difficulty finding a preschool that would accept him. Their district's special education preschool tried, but ultimately could not manage his aggression, self-injury, or ensure the safety of his peers and teachers. He was also not making gains on his IEP goals related to basic communication and self-help skills. After months of team meetings and trials of other programs, the team, which consisted of the parents, public school staff, and the boy's private therapists, the team agreed that Charlie could only receive a free appropriate public education at a private, education, a private special education residential school. Very unusual. Uh, at age four. So for him, the least restrictive environment was to not live at home and attend a highly restrictive placement. His story is provided in more detail on the uh, website that Eileen mentioned that uh, we created here, but I just want to highlight for a moment how gut-wrenching these decisions are for families and schools alike. These are not decisions that get made easily or lightly, nor should they be. Even though the least restrictive placement on paper is the general education classroom at the public school, it's not the least restrictive environment for everyone. The team has to ask, who is this child? What do they need? And then you determine the least restrictive environment. So let me now get to the, um, the range of education placements that are available by law. And there are some in-district and out-of-district placements. Uh, the general education classroom, also known as the inclusion classroom, where children with special needs are included with typically developing students at the same grade level. Uh, special education students may have an in-class aide to assist at certain times of the day. There may be pull-out instruction for, um, on an individual or small group basis. There may be speech therapy, a uh, reading or math tutorial, or a social skills group, things like that. Full inclusion refers to when the child is in the general education classroom for 80% or more of the time, and that means 20% or less of the time is in those pullout services. And partial inclusion is just a little bit different balance where the child is in the general education class between 60 and 80% of the time and more pullout services uh, as needed. Uh, the next placement that's slightly more restrictive but still in the public school are substantially separate classrooms. Sometimes people call them self-contained classrooms. They offer a highly modified curriculum with trained teachers, often for a particular population uh, or delivering a certain type of instruction. There may be language-based instruction for children with dyslexia, applied behavioral analysis for children with autism, Educators carefully assess, even if a child is placed in a substantially separate classroom, if there are areas where the child can access the general education curriculum so that they can be included with typically developing pe peers whenever possible. So they may look at certain subject areas, art, music, PE, lunch, and transportation and, and determine, you know, does the child need uh, a different transportation or can they take the regular school bus? So each area is looked at to um, you know, see what where the child can be with typical peers. And uh, the last in-district option I've listed here is educational collaboratives. This is when public schools of nearby towns share their resources and offer specialized programs in one of their buildings. Collaboratives are designed to meet the needs of a particular population. It may be children with physical disabilities, developmental or intellectual disabilities, or low incidence disabilities. Sometimes children are referred to a collaborative outside of their district if the local uh, district programs can't meet the child's needs. And on a later slide, I'll include a link 
for anyone who wants to learn more about collaboratives and the um, some of the other options as well, the uh, uh, out of district options as well. So um, just to highlight the numbers again, remember that 89% of students um, who are on IEPs are placed in one of those uh, in district options. And then next are the more restrictive placements, the out of district or private schools, which serves 3% uh, of students. I'll cover later the remaining 8%. I mean, it, it'll include kids who are homeschooled and other things, and I'll, I'll include it on a later slide as well. So the private special education day schools provide specialized instruction by highly trained staff. Uh, they're also designed to meet the needs of a particular population or to deliver specific teaching methods. Uh, some private special ed schools might provide one, a one-on-one -on -one tutoring model uh, across the whole day. Uh, they might have Orton Gillingham or other Wilson reading techniques. One way to think of these schools is that they're a good fit for students who have severe or complex needs or low incidence disabilities. The most restrictive option on the continuum is a residential placement. The student's needs are 24 seven and cannot be met in any other setting. Residential schools might offer a combined private day school and a group home in the community, or the day school and the housing are all part of the same campus. What public schools report is that the main reasons for these referrals to residential schools are safety and behavior problems. The issue of when residential schooling is needed is complex and emotional for families and schools alike. And I won't cover this uh, in detail due to the time constraints. I think the topic of residential schooling could be its own entire webinar, but the website that I created with the Federation covers a range of topics related to residential placement in depth, when to consider it, how parents grapple with the pros and cons, uh, preparing for placement, coping with placement after it's occurred, regardless of the child's age, whether the child is four, 14 or 40, uh, let's say for an adult who's always lived at home and has parents who are aging and is about to move to a group home in the community for the first time, it can be a very difficult decision, uh, very emotional for a family and their team to make. So those resources are available. So that's an overview of the majority of the placements. Uh, there's a few slides coming about some other less common ones, but still important to mention. Uh, but while on this slide, I want to explain a couple things about how this all works. First is that these are not menu options that parents can simply choose and say, I'd like this one. There has to be some justification for a move to a more restrictive setting. And it typically occurs in a stepwise fashion, uh, though there are exceptions. I've, I mentioned this because I, I've known parents whose children will receive a diagnosis if they get some private uh, neuropsychological testing and immediately want their child to attend a specialized private day school uh, to meet their needs. But there's a process to go through in determining if this is necessary, uh, especially if parents want public funding. Just a reminder that the legal protections um, of the least restrictive environment are important even if they slow things down for parents and children who may be feeling desperate. We wouldn't want to turn uh, back the clock, uh, return to the days of automatically separating or excluding children with disabilities, at worst in our history, placing children in institutions. These are hard fought rights that are still being fought today. For example, I've known parents of children with disabilities such as Down syndrome who preferred their children to be placed in a general education classroom and have had to advocate strongly for this, even with the law on their side. So as a general rule, a child has to try everything that the public schools have to offer before concluding that they cannot uh, provide a free appropriate public education and that a more restrictive placement is appropriate. Another point, sometimes parents ask me, what is better? We cannot assume that one placement type is generally better than another. It depends. You could find a substantially separate classroom in a public school that's of high quality or one that's of lower quality compared to the general education classroom. For example, some parents 
uh, have been eager to get their child into the in-districts, uh, say, autism classroom, thinking that the teacher's training and the methods would be more specialized, and sometimes that's true. And some parents have had the opposite view. They viewed the separate classrooms as being at a lower quality than the general education classroom and have advocated to keep their child there. So this may differ across school district where one has a strong program, another does not, and some parents feel their kids are being excluded. There's no one size fits all solution. I can't emphasize that enough. For every school, public or private, there are satisfied parents who have found a good match for their child's needs. And for every school, even those with a strong reputation, there are dissatisfied parents where the program's not a good match. It really comes down to the individual needs of a child. Let me offer an example of how a child might move through the different levels of placements until the least restrictive environment for the child was identified. Uh, a boy I'll call Sean has autism and he began kindergarten in the general education classroom with supports and did well. In first grade, his behaviors became more challenging and his language development regressed. After providing him with the maximum amount of supports on his IEP and improvements did not happen, his teachers and parents agreed that they should try the substantially separate classroom for children with autism. I'm summarizing things, but know that this kind of trial and error takes, can take months. It can be agonizing for families when day in, day out, the child is struggling. Maybe they're saying they hate school. Maybe they are even refusing to go. Um, so with Sean, he tried this substantially separate classroom for a couple of years. Uh, things were up and down. His parents overall felt he was not making gains and his behaviors were getting worse. And they began to advocate for a private day school. There were a few turning points for the family and the school. Sean was out to his eat with his family one day and he impulsively threw a knife across the restaurant, barely missing hitting a baby in a high chair. Similar unpredictable aggressive incidents were happening at school, and Sean was not making progress on his IEP goals for communication and life skills. It took about a year of team, meeting, team meetings, more agonizing um, you know, days and months at home, but the public school agreed to refer Sean to a private school specializing in teaching children with autism. This family made use of an ed educational advocate along the way, but not an attorney. His mother thought the reason they didn't need an attorney was because she worked to collaborate with the school at every turn, accepted their offers of more support, uh, both during the school day and the in-home assistance, such as parent training that they offered. But she's, his mother told me it was an awful process for all involved. The teachers were getting hit and kicked and scratched and bitten, as were his parents and uh, siblings at home. It was a hard way to live. After the referral was made, uh, the family had to wait another few months for one of the recommended schools to have an opening. But his parents felt it was worth the wait when they saw the results. Within the first three months, his challenging behaviors decreased his self-help and communication skills increased, and the teachers discovered he could read. At nine years old, no one knew he could read. And this is incredible to me and, and begs the question, how do we explain this? In my opinion, there are some children outside of the 89% who do well in the public school options who simply require more intensive specialized teaching methods, a smaller class size, or a more controlled environment. The benefits of exposure to typical peers, which for Sean, he had at home with his siblings, uh, but, but that was outweighed by his need for a more intensive, highly specialized instruction in order for him to thrive and meet his potential. Stories like these need to be shared because they are low incidence. Again, only 3% of students with disabilities attend private schools but they still represent about 6,000 families in Massachusetts. And when you are one of those families going through these difficult times, you may be inclined to think that you're not doing enough or you feel guilty that your child needs something different than their peers with similar disabilities. The irony is that for kids like Sean who need more, 
they're often less likely to get what they need in a timely way. I mean, you hear how long the family um, struggled for, for quite a few years. And when children move along the continuum from least to more restrictive, even if the child thrives, there are downsides. Families can become isolated when the child's not part of the neighborhood school anymore. Parents may feel ashamed to have a child who needs more and is not part of the majority who are successful in uh, the public school programs. Parents in the same boat have a way of finding each other, but it can be difficult because they're not the majority group and they have to work at finding and maintaining these connections. Sometimes families from the, the, the private day or residential uh, private schools come from different towns, so it, it, it's maybe harder to find uh, families to connect with and, and maintain that. So there are other uh, settings, like I mentioned. Uh, referrals can be made by community agencies, not just by public schools. And so children can be referred uh, by the Department of Mental Health, and they may be referred to uh, hospital psychiatric units or uh, a psychiatric residential treatment program. I'll have a parent story on that a little bit later. Um, the Department of Youth Services can refer a student to a correctional facility if there's been criminal conduct. The Department of Public Health can refer to uh, what used to be called the Massachusetts Hospital School. Uh, it's now the uh, Pappas Rehabilitation Hospital for Children uh, for those with physical and developmental disabilities. Or a child's physician can recommend a hospital or homeschool program. In every IEP, there's a page titled the IEP Placement Consent Form. I believe it's after the goals and the service delivery grid, and it lists all of these options, the, the previous slide of the table and then these as well. And then, you know, when you get your IEP in the mail, there'll be a box check that should indicate what the parents and the team have agreed to. And then some other placements that are made by choice and not by referral. Some kids receiving special education choose a career, technical or vocational high school. And um, this was the slide I mentioned where if anyone wants to learn more, there's uh, websites to get listings of the school and learn, schools and learn more about the options. Some people ask how private uh, special education schools are different than traditional private schools like religious or parochial schools, Montessori, Waldorf, or college prep high schools. So the difference is with traditional private schools, the families decide and pay tuition. Those schools are usually not approved by uh, the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. They may accept fi 504 plans and IEPs, but they're not legally required to do so. Um, and they may or may not be set up to serve children with special needs. But parents should know if they go this route that if their child is eligible for an IEP, the public school is still obligated to provide the services. Let's say the child uh, is eligible for occupational therapy or speech therapy. Um, the, the, the public school have to provide that either at home or at the, um, the, the private school that the child attends. Yes. May I make a yes, comment? Yes, please. Another difference um, that I found between um, the private schools and special education therapeutic schools um, is that children who go to a therapeutic school get their diploma from their Sunday school district. So that can be that. Um, important for sometimes for families who want their hometown mm -hmm. diploma as opposed to a mm -hmm. private school mm -hmm. diploma. Good to know. Thank you for mentioning that. It's yeah. the same um, diploma requirements mm -hmm. as at the Browns in Massachusetts, of course. Okay, great. So let me get to the steps parents can take if their child is not succeeding in school as, as they uh, hope. Calling a team meeting. That can happen at any time. Parents have the right to call the team to meet. They don't have to wait till the annual IEP meeting uh, is due to discuss their concerns. And in that meeting, I think parents should be candid about how much the child and they are struggling at home, feel unable to help the child, perhaps generalize skills that maybe they're mastering at school but aren't 
uh, transferring over to the home and the community or feel unsafe at home and they feel unable to manage the child's disability and express the worry that an out-of-home placement may become necessary at some times. I think conveying the sense of, of urgency, uh, being candid about wherever you are. Uh, the team may be able to respond by providing additional resources, in-home supports, so that all options are tried before having to consider a more restrictive placement. Raising the question with the private therapist that your child may see. Um, psychiatrist, pediatrician, psychologist, speech language pathologist. Um, I should mention that the child's public school teachers, um, other public school professionals may be less free to discuss this option even informally. Uh, the decisions about placement changes have to be made collectively by the IEP team. A key step in this process is the independent evaluation typically by a neuropsychologist. A neuropsychological evaluation is really critical in, in driving the IEP services that your child receives. And it can be an important addition to the, the evaluation performed by the district, which they're required to do every three years once your child's uh, IEP el eligible. Um, the neuropsychologist, uh, if you see one privately, will often conduct observations at school, possibly at home as part of the assessment. They may attend IEP meetings if you ask them to, and in general become part of your treatment team. And I should mention that legally, the district is only obligated to consider outside reports, not follow it completely or even agree with it. Um, that said, it tends to carry uh, a lot of weight. Parents can also meet with the district special education director. I think to think about this meeting as trying to be part of the solution, to go in, defining what the problems are, offer some ideas you have about what your child needs, how the district can um, respond. Um, I, I think if you are th contemplating whether a more restrictive placement is necessary, and feeling like the communications with the team are um, not going as you hope, sometimes it's just good to get on the radar of the uh, special education director and you know, have a discussion. Families can consult with or hire an educational advocate. It's less expensive to do than hiring an attorney. They can often offer more hands-on assistance, attending IEP meetings. The Federation has a brochure on the, on the website that uh, talks about selecting a special education advocate. It's available in multiple languages and has free and low cost advocates available. Parents can also call the Federation's call center. Uh, they can't provide legal advice, but they're open to receiving questions from parents and professionals about a wide range of topics. Um, the PRS, the Problem Resolution System, it used to be called Program Quality Assurance is run through the Department of Education, and they are a good resource to call if you think that uh, a child's IEP is not being followed or, the, or that there's some violation of the law that you're maybe concerned about or suspect. Obviously, hiring an attorney is an option. Uh, an advocate can often let parents know when it's time, when their efforts to negotiate with the district have reached a standstill. And just to mention the option, again, it's a, a risky one, but unilateral placement, like in the case with Andrew F. Some families will decide to send their child to a private day school and pay the tuition without being referred by the public school. The burden of proof is then on the parents to show that the out-of-district placement can provide the child with a free appropriate public education. So it's risky, but it has worked for some families, but you just don't know how long the legal process will take or if the district will agree to reimburse you for all or some of the uh, tuition that the parents have paid. And uh, cost sharing is another option as well, where parents agree to um, pay a portion of the private school tuition. May I give an example? Yeah, please. Um, independent evaluations are often really important and so can observations be. Mm -hmm. um, a family that I worked with had a child on the autism spectrum in middle school who was having um, difficulty with social and emotional needs and um, very depressed. And 
the neuropsychologist did all the testing and then went in to observe. And while they were observing, the class was asked to form a U and they could sit anywhere they wanted. And of course, being middle school, the girls all sat on one side and the boys all sat on the other side, except for the child who sat in the middle with his aide all alone. And that example was incredibly powerful to the mm -hmm. team in deciding to make the out of district play school. Mm -hmm. Realizing the child did not feel included at all yeah. in the, mm -hmm. the group. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't in inclusion in the true spirit of the word. Yeah. So yeah. observation yeah. can be a, a big asset. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So a suggestion I have when advocating with the district is that it's important to use the language of services whenever possible. Rich Robison, the former executive director of the Federation, used to quote Marty Mitnack, who said, special education is not about a place, but about the services the child receives. So this is not to say that placement's not important. This quote is in keeping with the focus on the individual child, what is the free appropriate public education? What's the least restrictive environment for that child? We first focus on the services needed for the child and the place matters if it gets the child the services that are appropriate. And think of it this way, when neuropsychologists write their recommendations, they never name a particular school in their reports. They may tell parents in their meetings uh, without writing it down, to visit certain schools, may name them and say, go observe their methods. This, I think this is a good fit. Uh, but in the reports, they'll stay focused on what services the child needs. And parents should do the same when advocating for their child. And the one of the language suggestion I'll put out there is to vo avoid asking for what's best for your child. I think as a parent, we think about, you know, and want, of course, what's best for our children. But I think the law does not guarantee the best education possible, and the term appropriate is the legal standard. So when the team does not agree, or when an IEP has been rejected, parents have uh, some additional options. SpedEx is um, a free service through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and it's a 30-day IEP dispute resolution. Uh, parents in the district will select from a list of consultants. One is chosen to review the case and make recommendations. Uh, Professor David Scanlon at Boston College uh, Department of Education, he coordinates the SpedEx program, and he described to me that some typical SpedEx cases involve FAPE and LRE. Uh, parents may wish for a greater amount of services um, or direct instruction for their child from specialists themselves rather than an aid or a general education teacher who's supervised by the specialist. So those are some of the differences. And he said that most of the time um, when they talk with districts and talk with the families, there's some creative solution that they help uh, figure out that's somewhere in the middle that maybe from a different position than either side had, had seen at the outset. Um, a few options that are offered by the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. One is a facilitated IEP meeting. This is when a mediator is brought into the IEP meeting and actively problem solves during the meeting to try to find places of mutual agreement. Um, and there's more information that you can find on this, uh, again, on the Federation's website under uh, parent training. They have family fact sheets. Uh, they're called family facts on special education. Um, I found them very useful, learned a lot there too. Um, mediation is another option that's free through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Parents and school staff meet separately with a mediator. So as opposed to the facilitated IEP meeting where somebody comes into the IEP meeting to help the communication go a little bit more smoothly, this is a, a longer process where parents and the district meet separately with the mediator. Um, some families report that they learn of options they didn't know or available to them when they've gone through mediation. And then the due process hearing uh, is another option to resolve differences. Um, an attorney is highly recommended for this process. Uh, it can be lengthy and expensive uh, to, to go this route. Okay, uh, let me get to parent stories. And again, if uh, we invite parents to email in their questions if they're having any along the way. Um, 
And again, identifying information has been changed on these stories, uh, shared with permission. There's a, a girl I'll call Aaliyah who has autism. During elementary school, she received pullout services for reading, small group instruction with a speech language pathologist for social communication skills, and an aide who floated around the classroom supporting all students, but was primarily there to support the two or three students with similar uh, IEP services. This worked well for Aaliyah throughout elementary school, but when the demands increased in middle school, academically, socially, the executive functioning and organizational skills required, she began to struggle quite a bit. Her team added some academic support blocks into her schedule that allowed for some uh, individual and small group tutoring time, extra time to do homework with, with assistance if needed, time to learn organizational skills. Things got better, but her parents began to wonder if she could benefit from being at a smaller school, perhaps a private school. So they toured a few uh, approved schools, like special education private schools, as well as those that were not approved. They made a pro-con list and decided in the end, after visiting many schools, taking their time to figure this out, that the advantages of staying in a local public school outweighed the advantages of any of the private schools. I think the inconvenience of the, you know, not having a bus to <laughs> pick up their kids and having to you know, do the transportation, the expense, um, the lack of a guarantee that an IEP would be followed, all these things factored into their decision making. But going through the process of exploring helped them to feel more satisfied with their daughter's uh, public school program. The next story is about a boy uh, I'll call Brandon, 10 year old boy with dyslexia and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. He was struggling in his general education classroom when the school completed their testing, they found him to be one year behind in reading. His parents had an older child and didn't feel this was quite right. They sought out private neuropsychological testing and it showed him to be three years behind grade level in reading. The school increased the support services and he started medication, which helped his ability to pay attention in class, but he was still behind in, in reading and some other academic uh, goals. His parents and the school agreed to a trial in the district's substantially separate classroom. They had a language-based program, which unfortunately for Brandon was located at a different elementary school. Brandon's social adjustment was hard. Uh, he began making some mild academic gains once he was exposed to the more specialized teaching approaches and a smaller class but his IEP goals were only met in the most minimal way, and his parents were not happy with the slow pace of his progress. Uh, a few years after they'd had uh, one private testing, they decided to repeat the testing uh, to get a more, and, and what this neuropsychological uh, eval concluded was that Brandon needed a more complete immersion in language-based instruction than, than the public school's substantially separate class could offer. This family did need to obtain a lawyer to resolve their disagreement with the district. It took another year of negotiations. And again, not to minimize that year of, you know, a kid being very unhappy um, at, at school and really struggling. Uh, but they, the family did get the placement that they wanted in a special education private school for children with learning disabilities. The district agreed to provide transportation and parents agreed to share the tuition payments with the district and Brandon is now thriving. One important point to highlight that, um, is that moving to a more restrictive placement should not be thought of as a failure of the student, the parents, the teachers, or the public school. Again, I can't emphasize enough that it's really about the individual needs of the child. There are other kids, like I said, who have moved from one to another program and have done well and it's a matter of just finding that, that uh, right fit. And just to say something about, another point about um, class size. Um, there's an author, uh, Daniel Franklin. He has a two, uh, 2018 book titled Helping Children with Language-Based Learning Disabilities. 
and he makes an interesting point about classroom size. He mentions that nowhere in nature do we observe any species with adult-child ratios similar to what we have in American classrooms, where there's 20, 25 or more students per one teacher. So even though this has become our norm, we don't think twice about it, it's worthwhile to pause and say that this you know, model just doesn't work for everyone. Teachers do an amazing job with the enormous responsibilities placed on them, but again, the model just doesn't work for all kids. May I um, yes. ask a question? Yes. If a student has full support of the district and is in an out-of-district placement at a special education private day school, and they can't pass the MCAS, and therefore not get a district diploma, will they still be eligible to receive a diploma from the private school? Hmm. I think I'd check on the policy of the private school. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I know so. that there are some schools that say, we don't require the MCAS, it's mm -hmm. only when a student receives public funding yes. that they have to take the MCAS at all. For students whose parents self-pay at one of the schools, they don't have to take MCAS at all. Yeah. So I think it's probably something to check with the school that your child attends to, to ask that question. It's yes. probably depends and, on their requirements. Yeah. And sometimes they may have something like a certificate of completion or something mm -hmm. that the child can be given mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. at graduation. Right, so, right. Because not all of our kids are going to pass the MCAT. Right, right. But the school could also potentially support student through the portfolio process. Right, so, like the alt, there's an yes. alternate MCAS mm -hmm. as well, so I'm not as familiar with if that counts. I mean, I know that the state will look at alternate uh, MCAS portfolios, but I don't know about when it yeah. meets graduation requirements or not. So yeah, yeah that I would check with the, the state, school. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, another point I wanted to make about the continuum of placements, um, and it's to provide an analogy with how the, our medical care system works. We think of our pediatricians and our primary care doctors as highly capable, very good at treating a wide range of illnesses. But when there's a problem that's beyond their level of specialty, doctors have an ethical responsibility to refer their patients to a specialist. It's not an admission of incompetence, but rather a professional and honest acknowledgement of the range and limits of one's area of expertise. And I think schools experience an ethical responsibility to provide an education for everyone. Again, it's embedded in the law. And I think, you know, all the teachers I've known have embraced that whole, wholeheartedly, especially special education teachers who are so dedicated. So it's wonderful, promotes inclusion. But I think there isn't always the same mindset as in the medical field around the willingness to acknowledge the range and limits of what one does well and when a child may need something different than what the public school can offer. I think in part this stems from the fact that the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 1975 has never been fully funded all these years at the federal level. It's only funded at about six or seven percent compared with the original intent of it being funded at about 40 percent when it was first conceived. So it's just never been a national budget priority in, in our country. So even though school districts get some reimbursement uh, from the government from what's called the circuit breaker funds, it doesn't completely cover the costs. So this combined with the least restrictive envir uh, environment requirements contribute to districts reticence to refer students out of district. All right, let me get back to some more examples. I think we still have some time. Uh, the next story is about Carlos, a teenage boy with a learning disability and a mood disorder. And this is the, the case where the DMH uh, funding came into play in, in a very critical way. So in elementary school, Carlos um, attended uh, the local elementary school and um, you know, struggled there until the LDs got diagnosed and then received a private day school placement, uh, the special education private school for children with learning disabilities. That was the primary concern at the time. And I'm kind of in the interest of uh, focusing on the other aspects of his story, glossing over that this was an agonizing long-term process required an attorney on the parents' part. But you know, for a couple of years, things went fairly smoothly. 
then when Carlos entered um, adolescence, early adolescence, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He had intense mood swings, erratic behavior, and outbursts. And after several years at his uh, private school for children with learning disabilities, the school informed the parents uh, that they could no longer manage him in the classroom. And the parents were also having great difficulty managing him at home. So two things were going on at the same time. The parents applied for services through the Department of Mental Health. They were able to receive um, quite a lot of hours of intensive in-home therapy. Uh, I believe there was a therapeutic mentor, some other services. Um, and at the same time, this um, parents and the school were also working together to find a different school that would focus more on the emotional and behavioral struggles. So the parents were concerned, is, is this new school gonna have less expertise in working with kids with learning disabilities? And uh, that turned out to be true and illustrates another important point of this process, that when you change placements, you may gain something, a child may gain something, but you may also give something up too. And I think in this case, what uh, Carlos lost was, um, you know, the uh, expert teaching for his learning disability. Um, and again, it was a little bit um, a, matter, a matter of prioritizing what's the most important need at the moment. Um, and, you know, it may, be, it may have been that the parents brought in extra tutors or the school did that, but uh, it, it was a difficult part of the process for this family. Um, and for, for other kids, you know, d different than uh, Carlos's situation, the movement to uh, the public to an out of district school could be that they lose involvement in an extracurricular activity that they thrive at. If their public school had a strong athletic program, arts program, debate team, you know, whatever it might be, and that a smaller private school may not have. Yeah, yeah please. Um, when a child is in an out of district placement, they are still entitled mm -hmm. to be involved in activities in the life of the school. So, right. extracurriculars. Um, mm -hmm school dances, things like that, but the mm -hmm. problem is often timing. Yep. Because when kids go to special education school, they may not have the same schedule mm -hmm. and may get home too late to participate in things like sports. Right, right. No, I'm glad you mentioned that it's still illegal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they can, but um, like let's say there's an art or music program that happens during the day or like you have to take this class. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain logistical things that get in the way of uh, all things working. But yes, if it's an after school program that the child can get to and the parents can get them to, they are eligible to do that just like um, uh, the, the other kids, absolutely. Um, but getting back to, to Carlos, so so he's in. The, he made the move from the special education private uh, day school for kids with learning disabilities to kids with behavioral and emotional difficulties and that worked well for a little while, but his mood disorder became more severe. He began um, to have suicidal uh, ideation, some self-cutting, uh, his aggression toward parents and his overall safety became more of an issue at home, as well as his uh, really being stuck developmentally in terms of learning um, basic life skills. He would refuse to shower, very non-compliant with brushing teeth and just basic, um, you know, doing laundry, household tasks. His parents found uh, that they were unable to, to manage his compliance across the board. Um, so they said, you know, he's getting older. I'm really worried about his ability to learn these skills. And uh, residential placement was sought by the parents and recommended by the neuropsychological evaluation and by all the private therapists working with him. So after a lengthy process, uh, again, attorney needed to be involved. The, what, what happened in his case is that the district agreed to fund the day school portion, which they had you know, been doing all these years, while DMH agreed to fund the residential program. Um, there were some tricky aspects to this because I think a lot of times the DMH um, residential programs might serve a different population um, and uh, you know might be kids from foster care backgrounds and I think people viewed that that might not be a good fit for Carlos so it, it was a challenge to have everybody agree on what the appropriate placement was for him. 
And um, let me just throw out a story that um, I thought I'd include just because I read about it in the news about a week ago. So there's no uh, nice resolution <laughs> to this like I had for the other one. So maybe it's not the best one to end on, but uh, I'll just tell you about her. Uh, this is an eight-year-old girl with Down syndrome, and this uh, took place in New Jersey, so this is not a local story. Uh, she was placed in a substantially separate classroom. I don't know anything about the previous years, uh, how well that had going, had how well things had been going, but. She came home from the first day of school with six bite marks on her face, arms, and legs. She, according to her parents, was afraid to go to school after that, crying at home, and during her crying episodes would kind of mimic a biting motion. Um, the parents immediately said, this is not gonna work. They requested an out-of-district placement, saying that the school can't keep her safe. Very difficult situation for the child and the parents, and you can understand why they would um, want this. The school's response uh, was to say, we take pride in the excellent training of our teachers and, you know, we take every step to keep every child safe. And parents tried to meet them halfway and say, look, we understand that behavior problems are inevitable. You know, it's a substantially separate classroom for kids who, um, you know, have issues and need more. Um, but they said six times, you know, six bites without a teacher intervening and what's happening there. So, you know, I'll be watching this case to see what happens. I think what happens may depend on what the school's response is. Um, will they offer a smaller classroom, a smaller teacher-student ratio? Um, do they make sure that she's not placed in a classroom with other children who have aggression in their uh, history? Uh, will the school add counseling services to address the, this trauma? Um, and again, what happens may depend on to what extent the girl had been successful previously and can they come together. But that's just an example of, um, you know, a point in time, you know, before things are resolved to say, oh, these, these uh, issues are very complicated. So are there any, I know we're almost about out of time. I, I want to make sure I get my acknowledgements in, but if there's other questions or things, you want me to do that first? Okay. So I think that is my next slide is the final um, thoughts and acknowledgements. Thank you to the parents who gave me permission to share their stories. Thanks to the Federation for making this topic a priority. Um, to uh, Jim Deute from MAPS, the Director of Government Affairs and Communication for help with some of the statistics. And to my son, Jack, who patiently teaches me things, technical things like making tables and doing PowerPoint. Um, and thanks, yeah, the Federation and RCCS for having me here. Yeah. Do you want me to go to the next slide for the... <laughs> sure. And please, yeah, please email us if you have questions after the fact, like um, mm -hmm. and the email's here. Thank you, Linda. That was an excellent presentation with lots of helpful information. I'd like to remind everyone that you will receive a follow-up survey, which we ask you to complete. We value this information so that we can provide everyone with the most effective information to support the wonderful work that you do in supporting children. Save the date for the RTSC's eighth annual Making a Difference Conference on November 19, 2019. As you can see on your slide, registration is open. And thank you again to everyone for joining us. We hope to see you again next month. This is RTSC.